to start off, I think it's really important that we think about what does equity mean. We do a lot of comparisons, equality and equity, and I do this in my own workshops. I have people think about what are the differences. Equality means giving everyone the same thing. Equity means giving people what they need. But I think we miss the mark if we don't take the opportunity to talk about why that need exists. And that need exists because we operate within a system that is inequitable. We operate within a society that is inequitable. Oppression exists. And so when we know that and we think about why that need is there, that need is there because there are people in this society, there are groups in this society who receive privilege based on identity, and then there are those who are marginalized based on aspects of their identity. So I think that's the first thing that we need to be really clear about. It's not a lacking on any part or any group, right? It's about the lack of equity in our society. The other piece that I think is really important as we get started is we think about a lot in equity, and I know it's important, outcomes. But if we don't think about the experiences every single day, students are in our schools hours, days, weeks, months, years. If we're not thinking about what those experiences look like along with the outcomes, then we're really going to miss the mark. Right? When we think about that time, what is that time? Is school sucking the life out of the kids? Or is it filling them? Is it enriching them? Is it adding to them? And we want to create those schools where the students would s never have to say, in the words of Nina Simone, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Those are the schools we want, equity and justice for all students. And I know there's lots of people in this room, we do equity work, I do equity work, we want it to be better for all of our learners. But what we have to understand is that we're starting, we're climbing up that actually our public mainstream school systems have never been equitable places. If we think about in the Canadian context, what has happened here, residential schools for indigenous children from the 1830s to 1996, and people say, oh, well, that was then and it's over. The impact of that is huge today for indigenous peoples and for all of us, right? And so we have to acknowledge that oppression happens in these really big ways and it's really clear, and I think most of us now would say, yes, residential school is very clear that that was such an oppressive system. But oppression happens in myriad other ways as well that we don't even think about. And if we understand the system of oppression, we know that it's individual ideas, beliefs, attitudes, hatred, and bias. We know that it's at the societal level. We absorb the stereotypes and the prejudices. And we might sit here and say, oh, I'm not prejudiced. I don't have stereotypes. Don't lie. We do, even if we don't know it. It's unconscious. Most of our bias is unconscious. We gotta do some work on ourselves. We gotta unpack the things we've been socialized to believe. And then we think about the systems, institutions like schools, where we have policies, practices, and procedures that hold some up and push others down. So how do we get to the place where we're pushing back against those things? What do we do? You know, it's really interesting because I think most of us are socialized to believe that schools are naturally fair and neutral places. But we really have to challenge ourselves on that. How can that be so in this unfair world? So I think about a couple of groups in society for whom the system hasn't worked, and I dream. I dream, I dream about students who have a physical challenge or a disability and maybe a mental health issue. And I dream that they enter into our schools and they are not stigmatized. I dream they enter into our schools and they can enter any space, place, or program that is there for everyone else. I dream that then they'll go in classrooms and there will be curriculum where they see themselves, curriculum where they're not the example of overcoming the odds. I dream about the schools where the kids who are gender non-binary, two-spirit, LGBTQ, come into the school and all of who I am is all good. I dream about going to that classroom and then that curriculum helps me to understand me. I walk into that classroom and nobody's questioning whether my history, my LGBTQ history should be taught or not taught. No one is questioning that we are seeing, oh, what? We can be a protagonist in a novel? There can be a story with a gay character? Not as the sidebar, not as the stereotype, not as the cutout gay best friend. What about kids whose families are experiencing poverty? When they walk in our schools, they wouldn't be inundated with those costly field trips that we keep doing. We say we know it's a problem, and we keep putting them out there. 
It wouldn't be pizza days or, or book fairs or, or homework that requires the internet. Glad to hear you don't have homework that requires the internet, or when you do, you provide for that. Or homework period, we can talk about that too. Wouldn't be graduation cap and gown, student fees, all those things that we know. Projects, how about school projects, where parents have to go buy materials, materials that might cost more than what students have, families have to feed their families on in a week. And then what about hmm, teachers who understand that schema is not intelligence and that intelligence is not correlated with a postal code? Teachers who would understand that your families, when you're a student whose family is experiencing poverty, that your families care just as much about you as the families who are middle class and upper class. And teachers who wouldn't say, you need to have grit, you need to have resilience, because they'd know you'd already have it and they'd know that that does nothing to change the systemic barriers that we've created. Oh, I think about the girls, girls who could walk in school and I can be a girl just like I am. I don't have to conform to any standard. I don't have to adhere to your sexist dress code. But all of who I am as a girl, I can just be me. And there's no one way to do that. I could walk into a classroom and there'd be curriculum that's talking about the issues for girls and women. And I'm talking about all girls and women. So the fact that black trans women are being killed at alarming rates today, we'd be talking about that. The fact that missing and murdered indigenous women, it's still an issue. We'd be talking about that. I then think as a girl, you would not need to recruit me to the STEM program because there wouldn't be a STEM program because we're already killing that game. And then when I think about those spaces and places that I interact with in the school, I wouldn't have to worry about someone brushing up against me, grabbing me, groping me. If I went to a party, I wouldn't be afraid to take an open can of pop for fear someone put something in it to try to harm me later. And in addition to all that, for all the black girls out there, we would never have to say again, do not touch my hair. <laughs> and all the little girls, we wouldn't have to tell them, dream big, little ones because their realities would be big. We would have shown them that. And then I think about indigenous and black students when they walk into a school, any space they would enter into, whether it be the school office, whether it be a classroom, they would be seen. And they would be valued for who they are, not because they fit into the box you think they need to fit into. And guess what? Then, this is a big one, they'd be given the benefit of the doubt. Then, wait a minute, I go in my classroom, as that black student, and I would start to flip through the books, I would start to open my Chromebook, and there would be history there that was connected to who I am. The greats, the change makers, the thinkers, they would be like me. There would be information that taught me that math did not start with the Pythag Pythagorean theorem, but math came from Africa. There would be science that actually acknowledged that a lot of what we consider science today came from indigenous knowledges. I think about all of these things, our history and our present would matter in that space. I think it would be like Wakanda, <laughs> right? That fictional place from Black Panther, right? Where there was never colonization or enslavement. That's what it would feel like. And I know these issues are big and huge in our society, but each of us has a sphere of influence. What do we do with it? And so I encourage educators to think about a quote from Dr. Tina Bugrin. She said, teachers make more minute-by-minute -minute decisions than brain surgeons. What are we doing with those decisions? On whose ideology, on what ideology is it based? On what understandings? So what I'm gonna share with you right now are some thoughts that I have based on some of my Netflix favorites. So one is called Limitless, and it's about a group of women from India who started a running club. The next one's called Breaking Habits, and it's about self-declared anarchist activist nuns who are growing cannabis and then giving it away for people who can't afford it for the medical benefits of the CBD oil. That's a very good one. The other one's called Game Changers, about athletes who've decided to go and, and start a plant-based um, diet so that they can up their game, right? So how they're in, trying to increase their, their abilities. So I think about these documentaries, and yes, the topics are interesting, but that's not where I'm going. I started to think about this talk today, and I started to think about the titles. So in this work, what do I think we need to do in the last few minutes that I have? Limitless. We cannot think about this work of equity and changing, upending a system of oppression in our schools by thinking about the one thing we're going to do, the one check off, the one workshop, right? 
Okay, I'm 52.5, I'm owning it right now. I go to yoga, I go to an hour and a half class whenever I can, right? And so I go in and after the first class, they said, you gotta keep coming back, you gotta make the commitment. And then they have a board where you can have 500, you sign your name, I signed it last year. 500 classes, 1,000 classes, 2,000 classes. You gotta make the commitment if you wanna see the change. You gotta put in the time. I think about this equity work. We got hundreds, 500 years of oppression, and we think we can solve it in a 1.5 hour workshop? Come on, people. That's not gonna happen. What's the commitment? So we have to look at this work as ongoing, as a process, right? I'm not saying you can't get a good idea from that 1.5 hour workshop. I'm, can't, I'm not saying you can't get something to think about, but it's not gonna be the end. And I think when we do this work, we have to think about it as, again, what do I need to learn and possibly unlearn to move things forward. In my work, I try to encourage and invite educators to participate in a process called critically conscious practitioner inquiry. Our critical consciousness, according to Paula Freire and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is really the ability to perceive social, economic, and political oppression and to take action against it. And many of us know we work with culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy. One of the tenets is to help our students to build critical consciousness. But we can't help our students to do that if we're not doing it ourselves. And we know that most of us, intentionally and unintentionally, have been educated not to know that information. Right? And so how do we begin to learn what we need to learn to push back to oppression? So I think that's a really important thing. One of the things also a lot of people say in equity work is that it's really important to share stories. And I'm gonna argue that if we don't have that critical consciousness built, then the stories might not take us where we think we wanna go, right? And many of us know, again, from our own use of TED Talks, there is danger in a single story. But what about danger in a single analysis? I think about a toy that I had as a child. It was a kaleidoscope. And I would look through it and see the colors and shapes shifting and twisting. And when I look through that, and I understand stories, I bring all of what I know about the world to that story. When I share my story, do you filter my story through your kaleidoscope? And if you do, if your kaleidoscope is devoid of a systemic analysis, then do we come out where we need to be in terms of moving forward in equity? Or do you just have a story now that in your mind is the one-off, maybe the anomaly, or maybe keeps you comfortable? Habits. How do we break the habits, the habits that harm, the textbook we've always used, the lesson we've always done, the, oh gosh, the classics and the canon, I can't take it anymore. All of these things are based on particular ways of being, knowing, and doing in the world that are tied to power and privilege. Are we exploring that? Are we examining that? Are we thinking about the harm that that is causing to the students in our classroom spaces? The students who are not represented, but also the students who are represented, who need to know that this is not the full picture. So I think about a story, I think about a situation actually that happened, happened for me, and it happened for many students as I share the story in the province. But it comes from a text I'd seen, not a text, a post on social media, where a teacher had posted a picture of students holding balloons. And the post was about doing this great STEM activity about static electricity. And the teacher was encouraging the students, hold the balloon over your head and watch your hair fly kind of thing, right? You see my face? <laughs> and so I look at the picture that was posted. This was posted. You know, boards post stuff. You guys got to be careful what you post. Post stuff like this. And I was horrified, though, because in the middle of that room, like 95% of the kids were doing it. But in the middle of that room, there sat one little girl, one black child who sat there with the balloon in her lap. She wasn't holding the balloon over her head. She was not looking at the camera and smiling like the other kids. And my heart sank. It sank for that little girl. It sank for the student maybe in the back who was in the hijab we couldn't see. But it also sank for my daughter. Because I remember the day in grade three when she came home and she said, Mommy, I couldn't do science today. When these things happen in our classrooms, they cause harm. Because my daughter with her beautiful braided African diasporic hair could not do that assignment. She couldn't do the assignment was one thing, but she also was made to feel that a part of who she is was inferior, lacking, insufficient. So I ask everybody here to just think about that. 
What are those habits that we have, those lessons and things we just keep doing because it's easy, it came in a kit, that harm, that cause harm, harm based on who kids are. So I ask everyone here, and I tell this story a lot, and I've actually told this story with black educators in the room, and how many hands go up and say, I remember. I remember the day that I was handed the balloon. We've been doing this for years. We've been causing harm for years. So I ask us all to think. It might not be that STEM activity, but what is your metaphorical balloon? What is the thing that you do that might cause a student harm, exclusion, a feeling of inferiority? And I firmly agree that if we don't raise our critical consciousness about how these things work and play out in our schools, that we are never going to move where we need to move. You know, people talk a lot about microaggressions. You hear microaggressions all the time, microaggressions, microaggressions. And I think that's such a misnomer because the impact of all of those is macro. And one of the other things we know in equity work, everybody knows it and I say it all the time, intent does not equal impact. And at the end of the day, where are we leaving kids? You know, there's a woman named um, Nora Allingham, and she actually worked decades ago for the Ministry of Education, Ontario Ministry of Education. She was a director, and she wrote a document called What is Curriculum? I share that a lot in my workshops, too. And she talks about how we have to think of everything we do, everything that we do as curriculum in schools, and if we're not thinking about everything, then we're not going to create the strategies that will work for all of our learners. I agree with that, and I'll add to that. If we are not building our critical consciousness about how oppression plays out in macro ways and in micro ways that don't feel so micro, then we are never going to get to the place where we have created those schools. If we don't understand this work as limitless, if we don't understand that it needs to be a process where we're going on a journey, right, and that critically conscious practitioner inquiry is a place where I'm building my critical consciousness and I'm inquiring, and I'm building my knowledge and I'm inquiring, and I'm building and I'm inquiring, and we keep it going because we need to learn so much that we all have not been exposed to or taught. I think if we do that, if we agree to engage in that way, then we might end up being able to change the game for our students because we've changed the game for ourselves. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll create those schools where all of our students can be, well, free. Thank you.